Okay, today what we're going to be working with are poems. And we're going to try using poems in a way probably different than you have in the past. It's called Poetry Alive. In other words, we're going to take a poem and bring it to life. How do we do that? By acting. So what's going to happen during this one class period is we're going to present some poems to you, and you're going to watch us, and then we're going to hand out some poems to you, and you're going to get some time to go out in a larger area and work in small groups on putting a presentation together for a poem. And then we're going to come back in here, and you're going to give us your presentations. So we're going to start off with Ms. Shiano. In moving slow, he has no peer. You ask him something in his ear, and he thinks about it for a year. And then before he says a word there, upside down, unlike a bird, he will assume that you have heard. A most exasperating lug but should you call his manner smug, he'll sigh oh, and give his branch a hug. So off again to sleep he goes, still swaying gently by his toes. And you just know he knows, he knows. The Sloth by Theodore Tufkin. Merry-Go-Round by Dorothy Walter Baruch. I climbed up on a merry-go-round, and it went around and around. I climbed up on a big brown horse, and it went up and down, around and around, and up and down. I sat high up on a big brown horse and rode around on the merry-go-round, and rode around on the merry-go-round. I rode around on the merry-go-round, around and around and around. Merry-go-round by Dorothy Walter Baruch. <clears throat> A poem by Eve Miriam. Don't be polite. Bite in. Pick it up with your fingers and lick the juice that may run down your chin. It is ready and right now, whenever you are. You do not need a knife, or fork, or spoon, or plate, or napkin, or tablecloth. For there is no core, or stem, or rind, or pit, or seed, or skin to throw away. How to Eat a Poem by Eve Miriam. From the top of a bridge, the river below is a piece of sky until you throw a penny in or a cockle shell or a pebble or two, or a bicycle bell, or a cobblestone, or a fat man's cane. And then you can see it's a river again. The difference is, when you drop your penny, the river has splashes. The sky hasn't any. The river is a piece of sky by John Shearer. Boy who is half past three, 
and the way they played together was beautiful to see. Now, she couldn't go romping and jumping, but the boy, no more could he, for he was a thin little fellow with a thin little twisted knee. They sat under the maple tree in the light, the bright sunlight under the maple tree, and the game they played together, I'll tell to you, just like it was told to me. It was hide and go seek they were playing, but you would never have known it to be with this old, 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 old lady and the boy with a twisted knee. He put his head down on his sound little right knee, and he guessed where she was hiding with guesses one, two, three. You're in the china closet, he called. And he laughed and he cried with glee. But it wasn't the china closet. But he still had two and three. You're in Papa's room in the cabinet with a queer old key. And she said, you're warm and warmer, but not quite right, said she. Well, it can't be the cupboard where Mother's things used to be. It must be the clothes press, Grandma. And he found her with his three. And then she took her fingers all, and covered her face all wrinkled and white and wee. And she guessed where the boy was hiding with a one and a two and a three. They never moved from their places under the old maple tree. This old, 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 old lady and the boy with the lame little knee. This dear, dear, dear lady and the boy who was half past three. Folks, I come up north, cause they told me the north was fine. I come up north, cause they told me the north was fine. Been up here six months, I'm about to lose my mind. This morning for breakfast, I charred the morning air. This morning for breakfast, I charred the morning air. But this evening for supper, I got evening air to spare. Believe I'll do a little dancing just to drive the blues away. A little dancing to drive the blues away. Because when I'm dancing, the blues forgets to stay. But if you was to ask me how the blues they come to be, says if you was to ask me how the blues they come to be, you wouldn't need to ask me. Just look at me and see. Evening Air Blues by Langston Hughes. <clears throat> Foul Shot by Edwin A. Hoey. With 260 stuck on the scoreboard and two seconds left hanging on the clock, the solemn boy in the center of eyes, squeezed by silence, Seeks out the line with his feet, soothes his hands along his uniform, gently drums the ball against the floor, then measures the waiting net, raises it on his right hand, balances it with his left, calms it with his fingertips, breathes, crouches, waits, and then, through a stretching of stillness, nudges it upward. The ball flies up and out, lands, leans, wobbles, wavers, hesitates, exasperates, plays it coy until every face begs with unsounding screams. And then, and then, and then, right before Aurora, dives down and through. Okay. Foul shot by Edwin A. Hope. What we're trying to do, instead of just taking a poem and reading it out loud, which a lot of, I know for a lot of you say it puts you to sleep, this sort of wakes you up and makes you a part of it. You become an active learner. 
What I'm going to do now is we're going to break in, I'm asking you to break into small groups, no group larger than three people. And then I'm going to give you each different poems, and you're going to go out in the big space out there and try to get as far away from the other groups as possible and practice the lines, make sure you know what the words are saying, and work on memorizing as much of it as you can. Of course, a lot of you, you won't be able to get memorized. I know the first time I tried this, I got all choked up, and I only had one line, and I kept turning the words around. All right, where are my groups? Okay, we've come back from the little groups and we're back in the large group, and what we want to do now is to see your individual presentations. If you choke up, go ahead and use the paper. That, there's nothing wrong with that. You haven't had a long time to work on it. So we don't expect perfect presentations. Just show enthusiasm and be as exciting as you can be. Do we have a volunteer to go first? Okay. You see, we three, Fred, Joe, and me, is chums. When I hello to Fred and Joe, they come. Most every day we go and play somewhere. If I have a bun and they have none, we share. We often slide and Fred can ride and swim and make a kite. I think a side of them. And Joey, too, he helps us do our sums. Because you see, Joe, Fred, and me is, is chums. from our shirts and scatters pins afar. The squeaking door will always squeak, for prithy don't you see, we leave the oiling to be done by Mr. Nobody. The finger marks upon the door, when none of us are made, we never leave the blinds unclosed to let the curtains fade. The ink we never spill, the boots that are lying around, you see, are not our boots, they all belong to Mr. Nobody.
Goodbye, schoolhouse. Goodbye, books. My pocket's full of fishing balls. I found my old last year's straw hat. My swimming suit. Baseball bat. I'm going to Grandma's house next week. Swim all summer and swim all week. And whether it shines or whether it pours. Grandpa and I are going to live outdoors. We'll cook by the campfire and talk about. I'm old enough to be a scout. We don't want to be in the house at all. To the school will bring it again next fall. I saw a proud, mysterious cat. I saw a proud, mysterious cat. Too proud to catch mouse or rat. Meow, meow, meow. But catnip she did much prefer. But catnip she would eat and purr. And goldfish she did much prefer. I saw a cat. This was but a dream. I saw a cat. It was but a dream. He scorned the slave who brought her cream. Unless the slave were dressed in style. Unless the slave were dressed in style. Who knelt before her all the while. Meow, meow, meow. <laughs> a little action into them. Our goal now is going to be to long range for you to find a poem that you feel comfortable with. For instance, when I picked Langston Hughes' poem, I had been through probably 50 poems to find that, and it was just one I felt good about, so it was easy for me to learn. The first one about how to eat a poem, it took me a long time to learn that because I didn't feel real good about it, and I had trouble finding what was the, the meaning behind the poem. So what you're going to do is you're going to find one and then you're going to spend a lot of time on individual presentation, which sometimes is easier because you don't have to depend on somebody else. They can throw you off if they miss a line or if they forget to do something. Any questions or any um, interesting experiences while you were trying to practice? Anybody find anything especially difficult when you were trying to learn from home? You all think it was easy? Good. Now, one thing that one of you said to me that was nice to hear was that nobody said, do we have to do this? Everybody seemed to get into it. What we're going to do now is um, go over some ways that you might memorize um, the one that you're going to do by yourself, give you some ideas, ways of practicing. I know for me, I just have to say it over and over and over again. And, you know, I work at a Disney part-time, and what I did was while I was on the bus, I kept the paper with me. And when I was driving, I just, you know, whenever I came to a stoplight or whatever, I'd look down at the paper and then I'd practice that, you know, a couple lines in my head. And then when I got to the next stoplight, I'd practice a few more lines and keep going that way with it. But they're going to share their experiences too. Ms. Shiana had some interesting experiences. She remembers. If I were to ask you to repeat the words to a, a top 40 song, how many of you could do that? Well, Repeat the words to any top 40 song that's out right now. In music. Several of you, in music, yeah. Okay, several of you could. Uh, how did you learn the words to that? Staying with it. Staying with it? Mm -hmm. By hearing it over and over and over again. Exactly. Now, some people can listen to it once or twice and they'll just know all the words. Because some people learn and memorize by, through listening very well. Correct? Some of you have to take a, you know, a more than once or twice. You have to hear it over and over, and then you'll pick them up. All right? So listening is one way. So like some people do. Mrs. Kinsey and I did this. We taped our poems, and then we put them, uh, we have tape recorder in our cars. We're driving along down the 436 saying our poems. We listen to them, and then we say them. That's one way to listen. I know for myself, however, I also need to visualize it in my mind. I need to see it on the page. And I see it in sections. And I practice it in sections. Uh, so some people can just listen. Some people need to look at it. Okay? And then, of course, by saying it, you're also listening to yourself. Uh, how many of you prefer looking at it and memorize better that way. Do you know yourself well enough to know that? Okay. Obviously, 
listening and looking are probably the best because the more sense of the senses that you have involved in memorizing, the better off you are. So if you listen and you look and then you speak it, then you've got three ways that you're learning it. So this, these are the ways that we learn. And uh, Mrs. Kinsey wanted to share some more ways. Uh, yeah, Miss Shannon, I think I already mentioned, but we didn't learn this in 15 minutes. <coughs> We've been working on them about three weeks, two or three weeks. So, you know, you have to give yourself time. And some of the things that I'm going to mention now, techniques for memorizing, you've already done, you've already experienced it today. But just to make it clear in your mind, read the poem silently. And you did that right away. As soon as Mr. Allman handed it to you, you started reading them. And that's what you have to do to, of course, when you select one, then you read it silently. And then you find keys to what the poem means. You have to understand it. But I think when you select one, you're not going to select one you don't understand anyway. But you do have to understand it. You do have to have a feeling for it, as Mr. Allman said. You have to like it. So be sure you do that. And then read that poem out loud 10 times, at least 10 times. I'm sure I must have done it many, many more times than that, but at least 10 times. That loosens your mouth muscles. It helps you to enunciate clearly. Um, it helps you to familiarize yourself with words that you're not familiar with. I know one of the poems here had the word privy in it. Uh, you have to learn how to say the word. You want to know what it means. So you want to pick out those kind of words, and it helps you to improve and enlarge your speaking vocabulary at the same time. Um, then you want to find words or phrases that suggest body movements. Sometimes those phrases are real obvious, like running or jumping and things like that. Other times the phrases are a little bit more uh, subtle, so you have to look for them. And then you want to find words or phrases that lend themselves to different levels of emotion. Now, you know the poem Mr. Almond did. It had a lot of emotion in it, and he had to put himself right into that mood. He wasn't up jumping around a lot, but you got the mood and the feeling for that by his tone of voice and the emotion that he showed. So those are the things you want to do. And then, as Ms. Shiano mentioned, it might be easier to learn it section by section, one stanza at a time. Do one and feel comfortable about it. And then you feel, you know, wow, I do know this. And then try the next one. Don't overwhelm yourself with trying to do it all at once. And sometimes, some of you might like even the old traditional way of one line at a time. Learn one line at a time. Whatever works for you, but be nice to yourself. Don't put yourself under a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. Take it a little at a time and work on it. I am really happy. This group did a super job with your poems. Your expressions were good, um, your body movements were good, and you did a great job for the first time. It was one other thing that I wanted to mention, and I, you know, you did it together, which is nice when you start off with you have somebody to help you through all that. But it's altogether different when you do something like this by yourself or in a group. Uh, when you're in a group, you're really depending on that person to do what they're supposed to do. If they happen to forget at that time, then you've got to be resourceful and do something else. You know, you've got to catch up with it or let it go on. And uh, that's more difficult than doing it yourself uh, because if you make a mistake yourself, you can correct it yourself and no one really knows, you know, uh, or if you forget a line. So you're really to be. Uh, complimented because I thought you did a nice job working with all the people that you worked with today for the first time. And how fast you did it. I mean, this is only one class period and you watched us perform and you went out and you worked on it and you've already performed. So imagine if you give yourself a week. I know I took the Langston Hughes poem. I started on that Saturday. I looked, I found it, but I spent five hours that night while I was driving the bus just practicing it over and over. I probably said it 50 times. I think it was. Yes. Um, they say, uh, research shows that in order to learn a new word and incorporate it in your vocabulary, you have to be exposed to that word 50 times, either through reading or writing or the spoken word. So in other words, people that remember, I'm sure some of your parents know poems by memory that they learned a long time ago, or your grandparents or other people you know that have memorized poems. 
because they said them so many times while they were in school that now it's just a part of them and they'll never forget those poems. And that's all. That's poetry life. Anybody like that? Because you see, Red Joe and me, it's his jobs. Lawrence Miller. That's what we're aiming for. Most of you probably learned close to that today in just 15 minutes. So, in other words, when you go to look for one, don't be scared if it's a page long, it's five stanzas long. Don't let that scare you because basically once you start memorizing it, most of you can have it down within an hour. It's just repeating it and repeating it to keep it fresh with you. In other words, I know one morning I started mine and then I thought I knew it and when it came about four hours later, I'd completely forgotten it and I had to go back and look at the lines again and start repeating it. Uh, the one that I did on one, two, three, did that seem like a long poem when I did it? It was ten verses, but it really didn't seem that long once you get it in your mind. To me, it didn't seem that long. But in looking at it, you might have thought, wow, that's a long one. But it had such a story to it that it wasn't difficult. So you have to think about that, too. Extra for us to go over. He moans and weeks, but we do not hear. Sorrow stands in his face for heavy weight and worry of people passing. The trees drop their leaves into the water. The sky nods to him. The leaves... Look. <laughs> <laughs> leaves float down like small ships on the blue surface, which is the sky. He is not always sad. He smiles to see the ships go down. <laughs> and the little children playing on the riverbanks. <coughs> okay. Oh. Mr. Nobody. Anonymous. I know a funny little man as quiet as a mouse who does the mischief that is done in everybody's house. There's no one ever sees his face, and yet we all agree that every plate you break is cracked by Mr. Nobody. Since he always tears our books, he leaves the door ajar. He pulls the buttons from our shirts and scatters pins afar. That squeaking door will always squeak. For pit, for pretty, don't you see? We leave the oiling to be done by Mr. Nobody. The finger marks upon the door, <coughs> by none of us are made. They never leave the blinds unclosed to let the curtains play. The ink we never spill. The boots that laying around, you see, are not our boots. They all belong to Mr. Nobody. The pheasant buzz, Robert P. Chips Chance Caution. The pheasant cock sprang into view, a living jewel, a piece of wood, to simply hold on empty space, going bold to God without the grace. He was a hymn from Canada Peace, with not a tender note or me. Then the gun let out its thunder, the bird defended, stuck with wonder. He ran a little, then amazed, settled with his head upraised. The few can float out of his eyes and left them meek and large and wide. Gentleness relaxed his head. He lay in jeweled feathers. Yes. He says that by Robert P. to his chin coffin. Joey, too, 
He helps us do our sums because you see. Fred. <laughs> and he is Chubbs. <laughs> Dolly is a dreadful hair. Her name is Miss Amanda. 
I dress her up and curl her hair and feed her taffy candy. Yet heedless of the pleading voice of her devoted mother, she will not wed her mother's choice, but says she'll wed another. I have her wed to China Mace. There is no Dresden rare. You might go searching every place and never find a fairer. He is a gentle pinkish youth, but that there's no denying. You want to speak of him forsooth, a man who falls to crying. She loves the drunk, that's very plain, and scorns the vape, so clever. And weeping vows she will remain a spinster doll forever. The protestations of the drum, I am convinced, are hollow. And once the stressing time should come, how soon will ruin follow? Yet all in vain the Dresden boy from yonder mantle woos her. A mania for that vulgar toy, the noisy gem and boozer. In vain I wheel her to and fro, and reason with her wildly. Her wax and tears and torrents blow, her sawdust heart beats wildly. I'm sure that when I'm big and tall and wear long trailing dresses, I shan't encourage any foes at all till Mama acquiesces. Our choice will be a suitor then, as pretty as the spaces. Oh, oh how we'll hate the noisy men with whiskers on their faces. The naughty doll by unknown. The night was coming very fast. We reached the night was coming very fast. We reached the gate as I ran past. The pigeons had gone to the tower of the church, and all the hens were on their perch. Up in the barn I thought I heard a piece of little purring word, and I stopped inside, waiting, staying, to try and hear what the hens were saying. They were saying something that was plain, asking asking it over and over again. One of them moved and turned around. Her feathers made a ruffle sound, a ruffle sound like a push full of birds, and she and she said her little asking words. She pushed her head between her wings, and everything, nothing answered it. Now what are you doing? You sure are strange for a bird. Look at those funny feathers, red, white, and blue. I smile at the little bird, who looks annoyed as if I'm intruding his place. He hops in a small circle around me, looking me over. When he finally comes back around, there's a look on his face of satisfaction, a look of approval. Then he hops back into the forest, never to be seen again. The boa constrictor by Carl Swatton. He's huge and hungry and extremely fat. His favorite food is a roadkill cat. He's, he slinks and slithers about the world, eating cats that were hit and hurled. His long, slender body is covered with scales, and he hangs off like a chauvinistic mouse. His heart is black and cold, his teeth are curled with ugly green ones. He's got diamond shaped pattern down his back, and those who try to catch him receive a big smack. For those of you who think he's mean and cruel, I'm coming to think about your right. 